good morning, everyone. Welcome to Concordia. I'm Natalie. I'm one of the worship leaders here. Uh, we have some special guests with us. Our Women's Stars Retreat is back. Hello. It's very loud on this side. We're not going to do any side competitions today because I think we would know who would win. But we are going to sing together. So let's stand on up. We're going to sing a first song together. Let's get our hands clapping.
I am really glad that you are here for worship today and for this morning. Uh, our senior pastor, Pastor Tucker, he is gallivanting around in Israel, and uh, we've gotten plenty of updates. They're having a good time. They are safe. They are seeing the sights, and they're learning a lot about our faith. It's just one of the ways that uh, we can kind of deepen our faith, to walk in the places where Jesus walked. He'll be back next week, and speaking of next week, next week is a big week here at Concordia. It is Concordia Fest. It is our fall festival for the first time in two years, thanks to COVID last year. It didn't happen, but from noon to four, right? after this service, we're going to kick off all sorts of fun and frivolity. We'll have pony rides, and we'll have games, and we'll have big bouncy houses, and uh, we'll have food trucks here. And so please, bring your family, bring your kids, bring your parents, bring your grandkids, bring your grandparents, bring whoever you want to bring, and join us for Concordia Fest from noon to four next week, right after the service. It is going to be a great time. Now, another thing I want to mention, on your way out the door today, if you go to the right in the entryway, you're going to see our um, at-home center. And uh, our at-home center has various resources for you and your family. And uh, this is a great resource, especially right now, because we're in a series on the family. And so uh, we have a brand new guide out that's going to help you pray with your family. You know, sometimes you don't know what to pray or how to pray. It just gives you very practical tips for praying with your family throughout the course of the week. And so feel free to pick one of these up on your way out the door out of worship this morning. And feel free to pick a couple up and share one with a friend. Now, at this point, I need to invite a whole big group of folks, of ladies over here. Come on up to the, to the, to the stairs. So um, over the past couple of days... Um, our ladies have been a part of a STARS retreat, okay? And a STARS retreat, the premise of it is actually very, very simple, okay? The premise of the STARS retreat is just a way to strengthen your faith by spending intentional time with Jesus and intentional time with, with, with each other. You, you, can, you can walk to the side of me. It's going to be okay, all right? Uh, it's intentional time with Jesus and intentional time with each other. And one of the cool things that I love about our STARS retreat every time we're a part of it is that the people come back from it incredibly fired up and ready to go. So, um, so ladies, are you fired up and ready to go? I'm just curious. Are you fired up and ready to go? I'm just curious. Okay, so they're going to sing a song for us, um, and uh, it's going to be amazing. Here's how powerful the Stars Retreat is, okay? Here's how powerful the Stars Retreat is. We actually have someone here visiting from Virginia who is part of our online worship service, and uh, she wanted to... Uh, she wanted to come and join us just for the STARS retreat. And so, now I'm going to part the waters here for just a second. And um, y'all are an amazing looking worship team, all right? And so please, lead us in song. Ladies, take it away.
Thank you, ladies. That was awesome. It was very beautiful. Love those words. Although I did think at the very beginning that Pastor Zach was going to get stuck in the middle and, and, uh, <laughs> and going to be singing with you all. I was kind of disappointed that didn't happen. But, uh, but you guys did great. It was beautiful. I uh, love those words. Lord, I am yours. Um, and the cheering at the end, right, recognizing that God is good in this weekend working through y'all. And men, for those of you that, that, again, in a month, I think it's a month from now, we have a retreat for men's stars. And then I'm the youth pastor, so youth stars also. Uh, if you're a youth uh, in uh, January, it's coming up soon, actually. We're, the signups are, are open. So we'd love for you to be a part of these, these weekends that shape life and, and kind of... Uh, firm up some, some places in faith and, and ultimately connect to, uh, to other people that are really awesome. So thank you. I'm glad that you guys had that experience and thank you for blessing us uh, this morning. Um, whether you're up in uh, Kerrville or Chrysalis or wherever, I don't remember, where, where were you guys this weekend? Camp Chrysalis. Whether you're there or whether you're here, we go and we're gathered in the name of our God. The God that's good a God that loves, a God that knows us. We begin in his name, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We recognize some things about who he is, but we also acknowledge who we are. That we don't always do the right thing. We don't always say the right thing. We don't always go in the right direction. We go sometimes in our own path, in our own way. But we come together on a Sunday to acknowledge that this is not the place where perfect people gather. This is the place where people gather who admit and acknowledge that, man, we need Jesus. Can't do this on our own. So you spend a moment of time in uh, confession. I invite you to close your eyes or whatever, however it is that you turn your hearts to God as we confess our sins today. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we come before you. And you know us. You know us completely and love us completely still. And we don't always totally understand that because we don't always do Lord, what you want us to, we don't even do what we want ourselves to do, let alone what you want us to, Lord. And so this morning we just confess our need for you, confess our sin, our brokenness, our shame, our failures, the places where we feel like we don't measure up. But Lord, we confess that, that you are good and your forgiveness covers us completely. Hear us now in this time of silence as we lift up those maybe specific sins that are burdening our, our hearts uh, this morning. Forgive us, Lord, because of Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. One of the things that we like to do, we like to carry around our sin. Maybe sometimes hide it behind our back or hold it over our own heads. But the reality is is that our God takes that sin from us. says, that's not yours to hold on to anymore. And he gives to us rather the freedom, the forgiveness, the grace of Jesus. So know that today, if you've been carrying sin for your whole life, or just struggling with something this week, know that because of Jesus... You're forgiven. Turn to the person next and say, hey, you're forgiven. And that is good news this morning. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So uh, we have an action-packed service today, along with the uh, Lady Stars and uh, all sorts of other fun going on this week and next week. We also have a baptism. And uh, a baptism is a real special moment in the life of the church. You know, baptism is a gift that is given to us by Jesus. He says in the last chapter of Matthew um, to his disciples, I want you to go and make more disciples. And I want you to do that with all the nations. And here's how I want you to do that. I want you to do that by baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And then by teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And then after Jesus says that, he, he gives a promise that is just beautiful. He says, I'm going to be with you always until the very end of the age. And and that promise, it's for all of us, from the oldest of us to the youngest of us. In fact, there's this one time in Mark chapter 10 where um, people are bringing little children, kind of like Lila, to Jesus to uh, have him bless them. And Jesus' disciples get it in their mind that Jesus is, is too busy for kids. And so they try to push the parents and the kids away, and Jesus says, no way. Let the little children come to me, he says, because the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. As Pastor Ben said just a moment ago, everybody, everybody needs Jesus. And that's what baptism is all about. 
little bit of water and a name spoken over a child and a miracle happens. Jesus is there for her just like he's there for us. Now when we baptize, we do so in the name of God, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and we mean something when we say that. We mean that we believe in a very specific God who's revealed himself to us. And so together, we're gonna use the ancient words of a creed of the church that explain who God is, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I'd invite you to say these words with me. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified and died in the Spirit. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the last. Amen. You know, when we baptize into that name, it's, it's a new beginning. Jesus sends a spirit. Faith grows in a little, tiny heart. Now, because this is a new beginning, um, as parents, as sponsors, um, we ask you guys to make some promises because this is just the beginning for her. Jesus has so much more for her. And so as parents and sponsors, I ask you, do you promise to put Lila in mind of the love that God has for her in Jesus? Do you promise to bring her to the services of God's house? Do you promise to place in her hands the Holy Scriptures as she gets a little bit older? Do you promise to bring her to the table of God to receive Jesus' body and blood? But, but most of all, do you promise to remind her every day that God's love is sure for her in his son Jesus? If so, as parents and sponsors say, we will with God's help. We will with God's help. All right. Amy, come here. All right. Thank you. Hi. Is he good? All right. Who brings this child to be baptized? And how is this child to be named? Lila Grace. Lila Grace. I baptize you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And now, Lila, receive the sign of the cross over your forehead and over your heart to mark you as a precious and redeemed daughter of God. Will you welcome our sister in Christ? Would you pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, I am real thankful for Lila, and I'm thankful for her family. I'm thankful for all those who love her, and I'm thankful for you and what you do in her heart and her life. Father, your word says that when you begin a good work, you're faithful to complete it. And so complete it in her life as she follows you every day. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right. You're welcome. Congratulations, guys. Thanks, guys. Okay, I got to confess, while you were praying, Pastor Zach, I was not closing my eyes, and I was watching little Lyle look, look right up at you. It was really cute. Let's, uh, let's stand as we turn to the Word of God, shall we? We're in a series on faith and family, and Jesus said some interesting things here in this text, and Pastor Zach's going to unpack it. But it's starting in Mark chapter 10, verse 28. Then Peter spoke up. We have left everything. To follow you. Truly, I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age, homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, along with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are last, who are first, will be last and the last first. This is the word of the Lord. Y'all can have a seat. 
Um, it's a hard text, an interesting text, but it reminds us too of the family of faith that, uh, that Lila is a part of, that we are all connected in this way. And if you are looking for a family of faith, uh, if you're new to Concordia, this is your first time here, um, we are so glad that you are here uh, spending part of your weekend um, with us. And if you want to know more about Concordia, uh, we have a, well, you can ask anybody, mostly anybody will know, unless they're also new. And then you're like, well, hello, we're both new. Um, but you can go to, go to Welcome, the Welcome station in the back. There's some friendly folks there uh, that would love to meet you. They, we got a gift for you as well. Uh, again, we can't wait to, to, to learn and to love you more. And maybe you can get go on one of these retreats sometime too. But uh, God bless you. I think we're going to sing another song, right? Offering. Oh, I need to do that. Um, <laughs> ushers, come on down. We're going to collect our offerings. Um, if you want to, there's, uh, there's different ways to be able to do uh, the offering. There's the old-fashioned way of passing the plate, or you can do the things on the screen with the app or the web or the, or the mail. But again, just thank you uh, for your generosity, uh, because th- your generosity to the ministry here at Concordia allows us to be able to, to hold out the message of life here in San Antonio uh, and around the world. Um, with all these different things going on this morning, I, now, now we're singing. All right, awesome. <laughs> Let's sing.
Man, it is a good thing to be in the house of God, praising his name, praise forever to the King of Kings. One of the ways that we get to lift God's name high is to turn to him with prayer. If you come here today and you are burdened, obviously we talked about sin, but if you're burdened with worry, anxiety, stress, just the reality of life, and you're not really sure who to talk to or who to turn to, uh, one, we know that we can turn to God. But two, I invite you to maybe submit a prayer request. In Concordia.cc, we have some friendly folks that would love to pray with you and for you uh, as well. And know that, I just want you to know you're not alone. You're not alone in the things that you're going through. And it's kind of, I think the ladies this weekend really realized that, right? Not alone in the things that we're going through. And I hope that that is what the church is, that we're not alone. So we go to our God together in prayer, uh, both here, but also throughout the week as well. Let's, let's go to our God in prayer right now. Lord God, Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you. You are the King of kings and Lord of lords. Lord God, I pray that you would fill our hearts with a sense of your presence, a sense of your peace, your purpose, for not just today, but tomorrow and the next, Lord, that you go with us and you go before us, that your name is on us. We bear that name wherever we go, Lord. Thank you for the opportunity that we get to point to you with our lives. Lord God, use all of our lives in service to you, Lord, in this series as we're talking about families. Lord, I just pray for our families. I pray that you bless and surround our, our, our families, the, the levels of brokenness and hurt. And, and Lord, you know all the different things that no family is perfect. And Lord, yet you are. So Lord, help our families in our, in our homes. Lord God, be with those families that are uh, grieving this week. Uh, fill them with a sense of your, your presence and your peace, your comfort and your strength, your spirit. Um, and Lord, my, we as the body come around those that are uh, grieving. Lord God, we pray for those that are in the hospital. We pray for the healing, for strength. Uh, we pray for miracles in places where uh, we are asking for miracles. And we pray for, for healing and, uh, and comfort for those places that need it. Lord God, we pray for our world. We pray for peace. Um, for our leaders, discernment, for our, our nation and our just everything, Lord. There's so much that, that we can't control, so much that we do not know. So help us, Lord, today and every day cling to the things that we are called to know. That you go with us, that you are for us, that you are good, that your son and his sacrifice and his love for us is, the, is our firm foundation in this rocky life, Lord. Be with us today. Fill us with your peace and your presence. And we pray all this in, in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us the day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil.
just stand and sing with us? There can usually be more time for leisure. I'm certainly in favor of those things. Leisure, fun. Who is it? Wouldn't we all be happier if we worked out a little system for living together in harmony? But how can we manage them? We'll have to work out the full answer together. Say, Mom, it's well. Family problems can be solved through frank and friendly discussion, which points the way to a happy family life. You know, this is beginning to be quite a family project. It certainly is. Oh, uh, yeah. Do any scenes in there remind you of your family? I can think of one scene in particular that reminds me of my family, right? Where the kids are going at it. Uh, so we're in this series right now. It's called Faith and Family. And in this series, we are talking about two of the most important things that we have in our lives, which are faith on the one hand and family on the other. And just in case you haven't been here or this is your first time here or you're a guest with us or you haven't been here for the series, right up front, let me give you the bottom line of this series. And the bottom line of this series is this. There is no such thing as a perfect family. Duh, right? You know that. If you have a family, if you grew up in a family, if you have seen a family, then you already know there is no such thing as a perfect family. Every family has struggles, every family has troubles, and every family from time to time needs a little help, and that's what this series is all about. Because in this series, we're taking a look at some of the most common struggles and troubles that families face and that families have, and then we're asking this question, how can faith help us when we struggle in our family. And so today, as we continue our series, we're going to be talking about a struggle that a lot of families have with setting priorities. Because making your family a priority with the busy lives that we all live and with the packed calendars that we all have, that can be difficult from time to time. Making priorities in your family with the busy lives that your family lives and with the packed calendars that they all have, that can be difficult sometimes too. And so we're talking about family and priorities today. Now, as we get going on this topic, I just want to begin with what I believe is a kind of a foundational and a fundamental assertion from the Bible about our priorities. And the fundamental and foundational assertion from the Bible about our priorities is this. Um, Jesus wants to be your top priority. Okay, before anything else, above anything else, beyond anything else, he should be number one. Jesus wants to be your top priority. So a few minutes ago in the service, Pastor Ben read to us this kind of interesting exchange that Peter, one of Jesus' followers, and Jesus has in Mark chapter 10. Uh, Peter comes to Jesus and he says to Jesus in verse 28, hey Jesus, we've left everything 
to follow you. And what Peter says here really is true. Because Jesus' disciples left a lot to follow him. Uh, They left their jobs to follow him. Before they were disciples, some of them were fishermen. Uh, There was one who was a tax collector. There was another one who was a professional accountant. They left all of that to follow Jesus. Uh, The disciples, they left their homes to follow Jesus. In this day and age, it was not uncommon for a person to be born in a place, grow up in a place, raise their own family in that place, and never leave that place, never leave their actual physical home or travel more than a few miles from their actual physical home. But then one day, there's this itinerant Galilean preacher who's calling people to follow him, and these disciples leave their homes to follow him. They give up their homes. Not only that, they actually give up the families that are in those homes. Sometimes I I think we have this misnomer and misconception about the disciples. You know, they were all single 20-something dudes, and so when another dude comes along and says, follow me, they go, yes, we'll just hop from Airbnb to Airbnb. That's not the way that that this works, okay? Most of the disciples we know from history and from the Bible, they, they were married. They had kids. In fact, Peter Right after Jesus calls Peter to follow him, we have this real interesting vignette in Mark chapter 1, verse 30. We read about Peter's mother-in-law. Peter's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever. And so the disciples go to Jesus and tell Jesus about her, and Jesus comes to her, takes her by the hand, and helps her up, and the fever leaves her. Now, got a question. Um, What do you need to have to have a mother-in-law? You need to have a wife, a spouse. And so when Peter followed Jesus, that's part of what he was, he was leaving behind, at least for a while. He was leaving his wife and his kids at home. When, when Peter says, we've left everything, Jesus, to follow you, what Peter says here is very, very true. Now, it's at this point that we're almost kind of hoping and expecting and praying that, that maybe Jesus will hear what Peter has to say, and he will say, okay, you know what? You actually have a pretty good point there, Peter. You guys have left a lot to follow me. So here's what we'll do. Why don't you take a three-day weekend, go home to your wife, go home to your kids, right? Have a good time, hug and kiss your wife, bounce your kids on your knee, and then after three days, you can come back to work and you can follow me. But that's not what Jesus does. That's not how Jesus responds. Instead, Jesus says in Mark 10, verse 29, truly I tell you, nobody who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and for the gospel." will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age, homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, along with persecutions. And in the age to come, eternal life. Jesus says to Peter and to the rest of the disciples, so um, you are following me. Good job. Because you have chosen wisely, even if it means leaving your family at home. Well, you follow me around the countryside, even if it means being away from your family for extended periods of time, choosing to follow me means that you have chosen wisely because Jesus says, I want to be your top priority. Even, just to clarify this, before your family. Now, Is it just me, or does that make anybody else in here just a little uncomfortable? Like, leaving your family for a long time to follow some preacher around a countryside? The temptation is, when we come across a passage like this, to try to explain it away, or justify it, or try to interpret it in such a way where we can go, that's not what Jesus really meant when he said what he had to say. But, but, but part of the problem is that Jesus does this over and over again in the Gospels. When it comes to him and the family, he says, I want to be your top priority even before your family. Matthew 10, verse 37, Jesus puts it like this. Anybody who loves their father or their mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anybody who loves their son or their daughter more than me is not worthy of me. I want to be your top priority, Jesus says, even before your family. Or how about this in Luke 9? Jesus is traveling along. And he's calling people almost indiscriminately to come and follow him. And so he says to one guy in verse 59, follow me. And the guy replies, Lord, I'll I'll follow you, but but first, let me go and bury my father. To which Jesus replies, let the dead bury their own dead. 
but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Wait, just, just a second. Did Jesus just say that he can't go to his father's funeral? That's like savage. But Jesus isn't done yet. Another guy comes to him, verse 61, and he says, Lord, I'll follow you, but, but first, let me go back and say goodbye to my family. To which Jesus says, nobody who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Wait, did, did Jesus just say that this guy can't go back and say goodbye to his family? Because that's cruel. We read these sayings of Jesus, these interactions that people have with Jesus, and we go, he is being hard and harsh and hurtful, and even if we're really honest with ourselves, he's being heartless. What is Jesus doing here? When he says these kinds of things, why is Jesus so insistent in this way in being people's first priority even before their family, you need to understand something about what Jesus has to say here. You need to understand the reason behind what Jesus has to say here. The reason that Jesus is so insistent that he is your first priority even before your family, the reason that Jesus wants to come before your family is because of what he wants for your family. Let me say this again. The reason that Jesus wants to come before your family is because of what he wants for your family. You see, Jesus loves your family. He wants good. He wants the best things for your family. But to have those things, to receive those things, to get those things, he needs to come first. Look at it like this. That, that first guy in Luke 9, when Jesus says to him, follow me, and the guy responds in Luke 9, verse 59, Lord, and then what's that next word right there? Lord, first, let me go and bury my father. Let me ask you a question. What if that guy would have said to Jesus, okay, Lord, first, I'll follow you. And then, I'll go and bury my father, too. You think that would have been a little bit better with Jesus? You know, I've heard that Jesus is pretty good at funerals. Very good at them. Because he brings hope into the midst of loss, right? He brings consolation into the midst of grief. I mean, good grief. He brings resurrection into the midst of death. Or how about the second guy? The second guy says in verse 61, I'll follow you, Lord, but, and what's that word again? <laughs> First, let me go and say goodbye to my family. Question, what do you think Jesus would have said to this guy if this guy would have said, hey, Lord, first I'll follow you. And then I'll go and say goodbye to my family too. You think Jesus can help us with goodbyes? You think he can bring some encouragement in the midst of separation and even hope for and a promise of reunification? I, I want to make something clear here, okay? The problem with these guys is not that one guy wants to go to his father's funeral. And the problem with the other guy is not that he wants to go and say goodbye to his family. The problem is they want to do that first. They want to do that before they follow Jesus, which means that they're going to do that without Jesus, and that's not what Jesus wants for your family. Jesus wants to be a part of your family. Even your most tender and terrible moments like a funeral, Jesus wants to be there. Even when you're going to be separated from your family for a while, Jesus wants to be there. And that's why he wants to come before your family. Because Jesus wants all sorts of good things for your family. In fact, I want to give you just a few things, three things that Jesus wants for your family. And these things come to us courtesy of a guy named Paul. Now, let me just give you a little background here. Uh, Paul was a church planter in the ancient world in the first century. He planted somewhere around the neighborhood of 20 churches all over the ancient world. 
And one of the churches that he planted was in a town called Ephesus. It is in modern-day Turkey. And the way that Paul would do this is he would plant a church, get the church going, then he would leave the church to go plant a next church, and then he would write letters back to that church to check in and to check up on how that church was doing. And we have a lot of these letters in the New Testament of the Bible. And so there's this letter from Paul to the church at Ephesus uh, called uh, Ephesians. And in Ephesians, Paul spends a lot of time talking to the church there about their families. And one of the reasons that, that I love and trust so much what Paul has to say about the family is because Paul himself as an adult did not have a family. He never got married, never had any kids, but here's what Paul knew. The family was important to Jesus. And if the family was important to Jesus, even if he didn't have a family of his own, the family was going to be important to him too. And so in this letter that he writes to the Ephesians, he gives us three things that Jesus wants for our family. Now, before we run through these things, let me just give you a little warning, okay? Uh, some of the language that Paul uses is going to take a little unpacking and some explaining. We're going to have to do a little bit of theological heavy lifting, so, so, so get ready. But if you will just bear with me and go with me on this journey, um, the payoff at the end could be really helpful and even life-changing for you and for your family. So, can you just kind of go with me on this journey? Yes or no? Answer? Okay, good. First thing that Jesus wants for our families, according to Paul. Jesus wants husbands and wives to love each other. Jesus wants husbands and wives to love each other. Here's the way that Paul teases this out in Ephesians 5, verse 22. He says, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. That seems very clear and uncontroversial. <laughs> Moving on. No. Um, <laughs> okay, there, there's a word here that we get a little hung up on, okay? What's, what's the word? Submit. submit, right? We read that, especially when Paul says it to wives, submit to your husbands, we go, wait just a second, that sounds chauvinistic and misogynistic, right, and paternalistic and archaic. What in the world is Paul doing here? Okay, I can assure you that what Paul is doing here is not misogynistic and chauvinistic and paternalistic. Actually, Paul is trying to give us a gift, and, and here's the gift. For Paul, submission is what love looks like. If you want to have a marriage that is amazing, learn the value and the beauty of, of submission. Here's the best way I know how to explain this, okay? Um, in our lives, we all have a mission. We all have something that's really important to us. We want to devote our lives to it. For some people, their mission in life is to make a lot of money. For other people, their mission in life is to be real powerful or be real famous. For other people, their mission in life is just to have a lot of fun, right? Work is just something you do between the weekends. But here's the problem, okay? Um, when two people get together, like in a marriage, like a husband and wife, you know what they bring into the marriage? Their own individual missions. And sometimes these missions get along just fine. But sometimes these missions don't. And it's at that moment, at that time, when you have to ask yourself a question. If me and my spouse are disagreeing on a mission, am I going to make my mission a submission to their mission because I love them? Now, this is something that we do all the time, just naturally, with people we really love. Uh, one of the things that my family and I will do every once in a while is we'll go on a bit of a trip. Sometimes it's like three hours down to the uh, Gulf Coast. Sometimes it's a couple of hours north to visit some friends outside of Austin. And uh, whenever we go on one of these longer trips, Daddy, that's me, has a mission. And here's the mission. To get from point A to point B very, very quickly. That's my mission, right? Don't want to stop. Go up to the speed limit. Go a little over the speed limit. Get there as quickly as possible. Here's the problem. When you have kids my age, you load everybody into the vehicle and about 30 minutes into the drive, you know what happens? I, I, I get a request. And the request usually sounds something like this, Daddy, I need to go to the bathroom. Anybody ever experienced this with their kids? Now I have a problem because I have a mission. My mission is not to stop. I want to get from point A to point B very, very quickly, but to go to the bathroom, what do we got to do? We got to 
stop. And so when my kids ask me to stop, what do you think I do? I stop. Okay, why do I stop? Because my seats aren't scotch guarded, that's why. No, I, I, no, that is not true. Um, it's because I love my children. And even though I may have this mission to get from point A to point B very, very quickly, I love my kids enough to say, you know what, I'm going to make my mission a submission to your mission of taking a stop and getting out of the vehicle. That's what people do when they love each other. And by the way, Paul knows this goes both ways. Right before he says in Ephesians 5 verse 22, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands. In Ephesians 5 verse 21, he uses the word again and he says submit, but this time it's to who? To one another out of reverence for Christ. Listen, if you're struggling in your marriage, how to show love in your marriage, one of the best things you can do for your marriage is to make whatever mission it is you have a submission to your spouse's mission. And what happens in your marriage might just be amazing. And that's what Jesus wants for your marriage. He wants husbands and wives to love each other. Here's the second thing Jesus wants for your family. Jesus wants parents and children to honor each other. Jesus wants parents and children to honor each other. So Paul keeps going, writing about the family. Ephesians 6 verse 1, he says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And if you're a parent in the room, you go, Amen, hallelujah, and preach it, right? It's probably your favorite verse. Okay, if you're a child in the room, you go, I don't like this verse, right? I, I do want to say something to you if, if, you're, if you're a child, and especially if you're at that age and stage where actually you're really not a child anymore, but you haven't quite made it all the way to adulthood. You're still living under your parents' roof and on your parents' dime. You know, you're, you're a teenager. I realize that a verse like Ephesians 6 verse 1 can be a really tough one to swallow. So can I give you something to think about? Um, Paul, Paul never says, children, never disagree with your parents. You, you can disagree. Now, the caveat is when you disagree, you do it respectfully. No eye rolls, no sarcasm, none of that. Respectfully and lovingly. But here's what obedience is, okay? Sometimes when you disagree, your, your mom or your dad might say, oh yeah, I see your point, and then everything's okay. But even when they don't, and even when you disagree, out of love and honor for your parents, you defer. That's what obedience is. I mean, think about this, right? Think about the wisdom that your parents have, the love that your parents have for you, and the experience in life that your parents have had before you. All of that, all of that experience might just be worth your obedience. That's a way you can honor your parents. Now again, this goes both ways, because right after Paul writes to kids, he writes to parents, and specifically to fathers, in verse 4 of Ephesians 6, he says, fathers, don't exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. Now, there's a word I want you to key in on here. It's the word exasperate. The New Testament, originally written in Greek, and the Greek word for exasperate is the word par or gizo, made up of two different parts. Par is a Greek preposition that means from, and or gizo is a Greek word that means anger. And so here's the idea of exasperation. Exasperation is what happens with your kids when you get angry at your kids as their parents. And then because you get angry at your kids, they get angry back at you. Exasperation, par or gizo, it is anger that flows from anger. And so Paul would say to parents, don't do that. Which means be very, very careful about getting angry at your kids. So let me ask the parents, how are you doing <laughs> when it comes to getting angry at your kids? This is tough, right? Because kids can try your patience. Paul would say, 
Who's the adults in the room, right? Here's, here's the way that I, that I think about this. Um, when I'm tempted to get angry at my kids, and when I do get angry at my kids, because I do, I just try to remind myself, um, when my kids are grown and gone, what do I want my kids to remember about me? Do I really want them to remember that I was always angry? Or that I worked really hard in their lives to treat them lovingly? That's the legacy I want to leave. How about you, parents? It's what Jesus wants for our families. He wants parents and children to honor each other. Okay, third thing that Jesus wants for our families. Jesus wants work and family to cooperate with each other. Jesus wants work and family to cooperate with each other. So Paul keeps going here in Ephesians 6, and in verse 5, he says, Slaves, we'll come back to that in just a second. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of hearts, just as you would obey Christ. Let me say a word about slavery in the ancient world, okay? Um, in the ancient world, there were two kind of main types of slavery. There was like an institutionalized slavery where people were treated as property, and they were belittled, and sometimes they were beaten. They were treated terribly, and you need to know this. I want to make this very clear, okay? The Bible unashamedly, unabashedly, unreservedly, unrelentingly condemns that institution of slavery. It is gross, it is disgusting, it is immoral, it is improper, it is wicked, it is depraved, it is wrong. Make no mistake about it. Have I made myself clear just to make sure? Okay, have I? Just want to make sure here. This is real important we get this right. In fact, if you don't believe me, there's like a whole letter devoted to this in the New Testament, okay? It's called the letter of Philemon. Philemon was a slave owner, and he treated his slaves so badly that his slave ran away. And so Paul writes this letter to Philemon. And he says, you can have your slave back, but not as a slave. You've got to free him. You've got to take him back as a brother. The Bible has no room for that institution of slavery. Now, there was another thing, okay, a practice that was called slavery, but it was quite a bit different, okay? Sometimes in the ancient world, kind of like in today, the economy would kind of take a, a turn down and people would lose their jobs. The problem was in the ancient world, um, you couldn't just go to the unemployment office and collect an unemployment check. And so if you wanted to make ends meet and provide for your family, you would have to go find a private donor and loaner who would kind of float you a little bit of money until you could find a job. And so you'd go find a private donor and loaner and they'd, they'd give you some money and then a couple of weeks would pass and you'd spend it and you still wouldn't have a job because the economy was in the tank and so you'd go back to the private donor and loaner and ask for more money, they'd give you more money and you'd keep looking for a job but you couldn't find one and then a couple of weeks would pass and so you'd have to go back again to the private donor and loaner and ask for more money and you still couldn't find a job because the economy was, was, was in the tank. And so there came a point where these private donors and loaners finally had to call on the debts. And when they did that, they had a couple of different choices, okay? They, they could go to the people they've loaned money to, and they could just say, hey, um, sorry, um, I'm going to cut my losses, and you're going to debtor's prison. That, that was a thing back then. You could get thrown into jail for failing to pay back loans. But, but here's the other thing the private donor and loaner could do. They could say to you, so you don't have a job? Let me help you with that. Let me give you a job. And here's, here, here's what I'll do, okay? If you come and work for my family, I will pay you <laughs> so that you can pay me. And then whatever's left over, you can use that to provide for your family. Now, sometimes the ancient world called that slavery. In our day and age, we'd almost refer to that as, as charity. And Paul says in Ephesians 6, if somebody gives you a job, if somebody's gracious to you, and you've been looking for a job, and they finally give you a job, well, then do your job. Treat the person who gave you that job with sincerity and respect. After all, they're helping you provide for your family. But, of course, Paul's not done yet. He, he turns it around in Ephesians 6, verse 9, and he says, now, masters... Treat your slaves in the same way, with respect and sincerity. Don't threaten them, since you know that he was both their master and yours, 
is in heaven. In other words, if you're a master, if you're a boss, you've got a boss who's watching you. So be careful how you treat those who work for you. In fact, let me just say something to you if you're a leader in the room, okay? If you're a manager, if you're what the Bible calls a master, it's okay to expect a lot out of your employees. That's okay. But when you expect a lot out of your employees, make sure you're also willing to give a lot to your employees. This is so difficult because in our day and age, we're always connected, right? We've got the phones in our pockets. You can reach any employee you want to any time of the day or the night, and it's so tempting to take advantage of that. Don't, because here's what you're doing, okay? When you don't give those who work for you a little bit of space, you're taking their job, and rather than making it a blessing to their family, or something that cooperates with their family, something they can use to provide for their family, you're turning it into something that competes with their family. I'm not sure that's the leader you want to be. This is something that Jesus wants for families, not competition between family and work. Jesus wants family and work to cooperate with each other. Now, part of the reason I work through that list with you is because in this list, Paul gives us something very valuable. He gives us a hierarchy of priorities. He actually gives us a way to prioritize our priorities. So he says, here, at the top of the list, your top priority should be who? It should be Jesus, right? And then right under Jesus comes your marriage, your husband or your wife. Make sure you pour into your marriage. Right under your marriage comes your children, the rest of your family. Make sure you pour into them. And then right under your children comes your career, your work, your job. Make sure you work hard at that. Here's the way I want you to prioritize your priorities. Number one, Jesus. Number two, your marriage. Number three, your children. Number four, your work. Now, let me give you a standard operating principle to make this list work for you. Okay? The lower down this list you go, the more you might have to say no. That is, if you want to prioritize your priorities. You never get to say no to Jesus. Sorry, he's always right. Okay, he's the Savior, he's the King of the world. You always say yes to him. But sometimes you may need to say no to your marriage for the sake of Jesus. Like if you and your spouse are on different pages faith-wise and they never want to go to church, you may need to say, well, no, I'm going to go to church. Or sometimes you may need to say no to your children for the sake of your marriage. Have you noticed, parents, there comes a time in your children's life where you stop being their parents and you start being their Uber? Has anybody noticed this? (laughs) They're always doing something every single night and you never get any time to yourselves. Well, maybe you got to take a night to yourself. Say no. I'm not going to take you here, there, and everywhere. Mom and dad are going out on a date night. It's a way to prioritize your priorities. Sometimes you may need to say no to your job for the sake of your kids. Your boss wants you to take that appointment on the weekend or late at night, and you may need to say, well, I already have an appointment. With my son or my daughter, the lower down this list you go, the more you might need to say no. Now, let's be honest about something. This is hard, right? It's hard to keep your priorities straight like this. You know, it was actually hard for the Ephesians. About 35 years, just a quick historical footnote here, about 35 years after Paul writes this letter to the Ephesians about their priorities and their families, um, they actually get another letter. This one is straight from Jesus. And we actually have a copy of this letter in the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. And here's what Jesus has to say to the Ephesians in Revelation 2, verse 4. I have something against you. And what does Jesus have against the Ephesians? That you have left your what? First love. Now, what's the Ephesians' first love? Jesus. They're a church. They're supposed to be all about Jesus. But even as a church, even 35 years later, they're still struggling to prioritize their priorities. 
In fact, let me just be real honest with you. Um, this was a message that I struggled to write. Because I struggled to get this right. Ministry and family, sometimes they compete. They don't cooperate. <laughs> there have been times when I come walking into the office in the morning and I have a list of things to do, like a mile long. And um, I always try to spend some time in the morning just reading my Bible and praying. And when the list of things gets really long, you know what the temptation is? To just skip that time, right? Because I can't spend any time with Jesus. I have so much to do for Jesus in ministry. How dumb is that? <laughs> but it's a struggle that I have. Maybe you have it too. You know, it's imperative. It's imperative that we get this right. Because the cost of getting this wrong is sky high, right? You don't prioritize your marriage and what might happen? You might lose your marriage. You don't prioritize your kids and what might happen? Your kids may grow up and they might not want to talk to you much anymore. And so there's one more question, if you'll just bear with me, that I really want to make sure we answer before I wrap up today, which is this. Um, when things get messed up, okay, when I don't prioritize my priorities in my family, and when my family falls apart, because maybe you're there right now, maybe you're living this right now, what do I do? How do I recover from that? There's this really touching and tender scene in John chapter 19. Jesus, he's on the cross, and John actually gives us kind of this panoramic view of what's going on around the cross. And in verse 25, John says that near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother Mary. And if you can just imagine Mary at this point, right? No mother hopes that her son grows up to be publicly humiliated and executed. So Mary is just heartbroken as she's watching her son. But her son is also watching her. Verse 26, when Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple John standing nearby, the John who wrote this gospel, he says to his mom, woman, here's your son. And he says to the disciple John, here's your mother. And then this line, from that time on, the disciple John took Jesus' mom into his home. Now, it's here that we learn. When our families get messed up because we don't prioritize our priorities, it is here that we learn what to do. Here's what you do. You need to return to the cross. And remember that Jesus died for you. And here's why you need to remember that, okay? Um, when Jesus died for you, and for me, he did something. He made us in to this incredible family. That's what he does for John and Mary. He makes them a family. And when our families are falling apart, when our families are broken, that's what he can do for you and for me. He can make us into a family in him. Um, here's here's kind of one way to think about this, okay? Um, I, I want to just wrap up by showing you two, two pictures, okay? Here's, here's the first picture. Uh, this is a picture of my wedding day. And there's my wife. And uh, on her left is her dad. On her right is her mom. And uh, on that day they both walked her down the aisle. And uh, sometimes in, in weddings, you, you may know this, the pastor asks a question, who gives this woman to be married to this man? And sometimes the dad will stand up and he'll say, I do, or he'll stand up and he will say, you know, her mother and I do. Uh, but on this day at our wedding, uh, Melody's parents, they had been separated since she was a real little girl, and so they both stood up. And they said, we do. Now, Melody's dad is a good and gregarious guy. He was real excited for his daughter. Melody's mom was also really excited, but it took her a little more convincing, okay? Because um, my wife growing up spent most of her time with, with her mom. She was mommy's little girl. But then one day, this, this guy came, you know, poking around and trying to court her and trying to date her. 
and she was a little skeptical. Thankfully, I, I, I managed to win her over with my charming personality <laughs> and my dapper good looks. Yeah, that's even funnier because there's no way that's true. Okay, so, so the truth of the matter is this. I just bribed her with chocolate, okay? Because she loved chocolate and I loved chocolate too. And after that, oh yeah, it was great. But, but even though she was really excited that day, it still took a lot for her to say, we do. But I'm so glad she did. Because in that moment, she was doing something amazing for me. She was entrusting me with a most precious part of her family. That's picture one. Here's picture two. Um, this is a picture of me and Melody on the day that our first daughter, our oldest child, Hope, was born. And I don't like this picture because I look like a goober, but I, I, I can tell you why. I was terrified, okay? I had no idea what to do with a baby. Uh, some of you may know this, some of you may not. Both of our kids are, are adopted. Uh, we used a local adoption agency here in San Antonio, and uh, they were both born in hospitals in downtown San Antonio. And so we get the call about Hope, and we go rushing down uh, to the hospital, and Texas law stipulates you gotta wait 48 hours for the mother to sign the paperwork to sign her rights away to the adoptive family. And so we get down there, and Hope is born, and those 48 hours are like the longest 48 hours of our lives, okay? But she finally signs the paperwork. And when she did, um, I was overwhelmed, kind of unexpectedly. I, I wasn't prepared for this. In fact, I, I was so overwhelmed that I actually had to go hide in the bathroom and I just cried for a while. True story, I really did. Because I was just amazed at how this woman, this mother, was so willing to give this amazingly precious gift to Melody and me. She was willing to entrust Melody and me with a most precious part of her family. You see, the reason, the reason that I have a family today is because that there were people along the way who were willing to entrust me with the most precious parts of their family. You know what the gospel is? The gospel is this. For God so loved the world that he was willing to entrust you and me with the most precious part of his family his one and only son. Now, we didn't do a very good job with his one and only son. People got jealous of him, and they plotted against him, and they arrested him, and they tried him, and they finally convicted him, and they mocked him, and they spit on him, and they nailed him to a tree. But you know what Jesus did from that tree? He created a brand new family. Lee, made up of you and me. And so, my brothers and sisters, and I can call you brothers and sisters, if your family's broken, if your family is not all you want it to be, if you have failed to prioritize your priorities, Remember, in Jesus, your family. And you know what family is for Jesus? You know what you are for Jesus? You're his top priority. He loves you.
Let's stand and pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for our families. And thank you for making all of us family. Um, when we struggle with our families, when things feel broken and broken down and messed up and backwards, just help us to remember that um, because your son died on a tree, you've made us all family. May that give us hope and joy. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, my brothers and sisters, yes, in Christ, as you leave this place, you leave his family, and you leave with the head of the family, Jesus himself. And because of him, you're blessed. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you his peace. And now, go and shine like stars in the universe as you hold out God's word of life. Amen. Have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday.